Good morning and welcome as we gather for worship today. Uh, Pastor Waldschmidt is here, but he's on partial paternity leave, which I think is a good thing for Wells pastors to have that opportunity. And it's a pleasure to be with you again. Our service is going to be following the order that we find printed in our worship folder. Today we're continuing our Lenten Sunday series on rethinking different aspects of our Christian faith and life. Today rethinking the matter of worship. And we pray that God will bless us as we worship in spirit and truth this morning. Our opening hymn is a familiar melody, but new words uh, translated by one of our Wells pastors from the German, Open Lovely Doors, hymn 912. now please rise as we continue on page one in the worship folder. This morning we gather as God's people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves 
and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing glory be to Jesus. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, the spirit to think and do what is right, that we who cannot do anything that is good without you may by your help be enabled to live according to your will. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. May be seated for the first lesson. Our Old Testament lesson does include some instructions on worship, especially when we get to the <laughs> commandment we call the third commandment. Here Moses relates to us the, the moral law of God in the form of the Ten Commandments that were given to the people of Israel. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Our psalm for today will read responsively 
uh, the psalm that talks about God's glory revealed in creation, but especially in the word that he has, has given to us. The heavens declare the glory of God. Day after day, they pour forth speech. The law of the Lord is perfect. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. The precepts of the Lord are right. The commands of the Lord are radiant. They are more precious than gold. They are sweeter than honey. By them your servant is warned. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second lesson from 1 Corinthians, Paul is contrasting the, the worldly wisdom that doesn't see God, can't find God, and yet puffs itself up is so important, where God has a different kind of wisdom, a different kind of power that he reveals to us in Christ our Savior. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel lesson. We begin with the gospel acclamation. It is written, his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Our gospel lesson for today is recorded in John chapter 2. This is one of the two records of Jesus cleansing the temple in Jerusalem. It will also serve as our sermon text for today. And I invite you to join me in reading uh, the gospel together in unison. And we begin. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture 
and the words that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated as we invite the children forward for our children's message. First thing, we got to sing the song. <laughs> I am trusty. Okay. very well. Well, watch my children, how, it is, how is it having a baby in the house? Good? All right. You like your new sister? All right. Don't, don't ask your parents to send her back, okay? Keep her. <laughs> and raise her well with all your, your knowledge. Okay. All right. I have a couple questions to get us started here. And the first question is this. Does God go to church? Does God go to church? No, maybe not. Well, we'll take, we'll see a show of hands. How many of you think God does go to church? Did you raise your hand? How many of you think God doesn't go to church? A couple don't. Okay. Well, actually, God does go to church. He tells us, <laughs> I'm with you always to the end of the world. This church is God's house, isn't it? Doesn't God live here? Sure, he does. And he's especially here when, when his word or baptism or holy communion are celebrated because then God's word is, is given to us and God's Holy Spirit gives us the blessings of God. So God is here. We can't see him. We can't touch him. But he is, he's right here. All right, now another question. Does the devil go to church? Does the devil go to church? Again, okay, no. How many raise, how many of you think the devil goes to church? How many of you think he doesn't go to church? Oh, you know, hate to disappoint you, but <laughs> he does go to church. Now, he doesn't go to church for the reasons you go to church. We go to church to listen to what God has to say, to get the blessings of God for our, our life. The devil does go to church. And in Mark chapter 1, there's the story where Jesus went into the, to the synagogue and the church. And guess what? There was a man there who was possessed by a demon. So we know that we know the devils go to church. <laughs> Why would the devil go to church? Why would the devil want to show up here at Christ Alone Church? Well, does he want to does he want to worship God? Does he want to honor God? Nope. When the devil comes, he only wants to cause some trouble. And you know who he wants to cause trouble for? For you. He wants to cause trouble for you. Because God wants you here and you want to be here so you can hear God's word, so you can take his blessings into your heart and life, and God can give you comfort and joy. And the devil wants none of that. He would like to have you close your ears, not listen to anything, think about other stuff, so you miss all the blessings. And I could use a volunteer to, to kind of show what the devil is really after. Got a volunteer? Okay, Molly was up first. So Molly, you're going to be my volunteer. My youngest daughter, Lydia, gave this to me for Christmas. And it is a really wonderful gift. 
It is something you put over your head when you're cutting the grass or you're working a chainsaw, and it just cancels out the noise. So Molly, if you'd stand up, please. Let me see if we can make this fit your head. Is that feeling comfy or not too comfortable? Is that better? Oh, whoops. We got it over here. Is that over your ears? Pretty well. Okay. It, does it cancel out a little bit of noise? Can you hear less? Okay. And now we're going to turn on. This has got an AM FM radio. So <laughs> does this even make it harder to hear? It does. Are you listening to some music now? Sadly, it's country western. I'm sorry. <laughs> But imagine if you had this on your head during the church service, do you think you'd get a lot out of the church service? No, because you'd be listening to this other, other songs and voices. You wouldn't be thinking about this stuff. This is what the devil wants to do. He wants to put something over your ears so that you don't think about or listen to what God wants to say to you so that you don't get anything out of going to church. Molly, you've endured country western for long enough. Let's turn that off. And thank you for being such a good model and a, and a good sport. All right. Do we want to make the devil happy? Not at all. So if the devil's going to come to church, there's a way to make him unhappy so that he really hates being here. And that is if we pay as good attention as we can to what going on in the service. When you're old enough to read, we follow the service, we listen carefully to everything that's said, and the devil's going to be very, very angry about that, and he's going to be so disappointed he came to church today, because he's not going to get his way with you, and of course God is going to be very pleased that you listened and gained the blessings that, that he had. Now, if you ever catch me wearing these during church, you know what you should do, right? You should pull them off my head and tell, say, Pastor Witt, how dare you try to not <laughs> listen to what's going on. Okay, let's bow our hearts and ask God to help us listen carefully to him. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are in this place that we call your house, that you are here with your word to bless our hearts in so many wonderful ways. Help us always pay attention to you and let us know that, that while the devil's here, we just want to make him angry by not listening to his suggestions that we shut our ears to what you tell us. Help us, Lord Jesus, to do this better every time we, we come to your house. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for your help. You can join your <coughs> families for the rest of the service. We'll continue with our sermon hymn. <laughs>
Our Savior reminds us that God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. You may be familiar with the name Ralph Waldo Emerson. Maybe he takes you back to high school days. He is one of America's greatest poets and essayists. He lived in the 1800s in the Boston area, especially prominent during the Civil War time. He was a deep thinker, and he was a great speaker. Emerson became rich and famous with his speeches. He was probably the greatest motivational speaker of his time. Here are some of his famous quotes. Maybe you've heard them. Our greatest glory is not in never falling, but in rising up every time we fall. Or nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. Or you can never do a kindness too soon, for you never know how soon it will be too late. That is all really very good stuff, good principles to remember and live by. One of the less famous things Emerson said was a sobering question he asked about worship. He asked this question, what greater calamity can come upon a nation than the loss of the worship of God? Let me just say it again. What greater calamity can come upon a nation than the loss of the worship of God? This is his old question, but it is really rather timely for the age in which we're living because it seems fewer Americans are really interested in the worship of God than there used to be. Emerson's question suggests that people who do not take God seriously, who do not have the desire and who do not make the effort to worship him, are merely inviting disaster on themselves. And that's an important point for us to consider. In our sermon series, These Lenten Sundays, we're being challenged to rethink some of the components of our Christian faith and life. Today we're focusing on rethinking our worship of God. And we're going to begin by looking at what worship is and then what are some of the ways that God wants us to go about worshiping. The word worship is the shortened form of the old English word worth-ship. You heard the word worth in there. In worship, someone is making a declaration of worth or value. In worship, someone is telling someone else just how valuable or how important that someone is to them. When it comes to our Christian worship of God, believing people are telling God just how much God means to us, how much he's worth to us. Well, that's an important thing to remember when you're sitting in a worship service or having a private devotion. What we Christians should be aiming to say is that God has supreme worth to us, far above anyone or anything else. And we're to do that through the confessions we declare, the prayers that we offer, the hymns that we sing, and the gifts that we dedicate to him. God's people declaring God's worth is a big part of worship. But it's not the only part of worship. There's another. God himself is also present and active in worship. And in Christian worship, God is also telling us how much we are worth to him. He speaks to us through his appointed messenger. Speaking on behalf of God, the pastor assures us of God's forgiveness. He reads the words of life in the scripture lesson. He proclaims the word-based sermon. He administers God's grace in Holy Communion. What wonderful things God tells us about our worth to him. He tells us that he loves us deeply 
that he cherishes us thoroughly. He tells us that we are worth the sacrifice of his greatest treasure, the life and death of his own son as our substitute. He assures us that we are so important to him that his great ultimate wish is that we would live with him forever in glory. In the worship of God, God is also telling us that we are all important to him and in our grateful response, we strive to tell God that he is all important to us. In the gospel lesson for today, we have a worship story in which Jesus cleansed the temple of some terribly wrong things. He did this in the early stages of his public ministry. He would do it again toward the end. Although the Apostles John's record of Jesus' words and actions is there for us, it's there for us to show us how to go about worshiping God. <clears throat> John begins his account this way. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. And his disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus took some rather drastic actions when he visited the temple at Passover time. Merchants had set up their businesses of selling animals to, so people could make the temple sacrifices. And they also had their businesses of exchanging people's money into the needed currency to meet the covenant requirements. Now, these were needed and they were helpful servant services. Imagine hauling a, a lamb 50 miles or an ox 50 miles so you can make your sacrifice in Jerusalem. But they did not belong in the temple courts. They didn't belong in church. The merchants were doing business in the courts where the Gentile worshipers of God were allowed. And you remember the temple design, the temple in the middle where the priests could go. Then around that was the court of the men where the Jewish men could go. Around that, the court of the women where the Jewish women could go. And then way on the outside was the court of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles could only go there if they wished to worship God. This is where the businesses were, were set up. The area designated for worship had become a busy, noisy, smelling bazaar, a place not at all conducive to quiet reflection and undisturbed prayer. Jesus was rightfully angry at what was happening to the house of worship. He protested by driving out all the animals, turning over the money-changing tables, and telling the merchants to leave. He rebuked them. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? Now, the merchants had permission to do this by the corrupt temple leaders. They had made a mockery of this holy space where God's people came to honor him. Jesus was announcing that the goal of believers' worship is this. It is to seriously seek to honor God. That's why we worship. Serious Christians have echoed Jesus' points in their own words. John Stott, who was chaplain to the Queen of England years ago, said, Worship is the highest and the noblest activity of which people, by the grace of God, are capable. Nothing more important we can do than worship God. C.S. Lewis observed, The glory of God is the real business of our life. A.W. Tozer exclaimed, we have been saved to worship our God. Worship is a serious matter. The worship of God is our response to his grace and blessings to us. God is our loving creator, our redeeming savior, our faithful sanctifier. He gives us so very, very much. He deserves all the honor, praise, and glory that we can possibly give him. Martin Luther says it this way, 
we cannot give God anything but praise and thanks. Why? Because everything else is what he gives us. Be it grace, words, works, gospel, faith, and all other things. Praising and thanking God is our proper response in worship. The perfect Son of God had perfect zeal for God the Father's house. He teaches us to have the same. To the Samaritan woman, Jesus said, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth, deep in their hearts. In the Psalms, he teaches us, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. May God help us insist that our worship be about seeking the honor of our God. Now, by clearing the temple courts of animals and merchants, Jesus not only made this point about seriously seeking God's honor, he also got rid of sinful distractions that were interfering with people's worship. Imagine the scene Jesus witnessed at the temple. It would be like um, coming to church where you want to worship God and finding your church had been turned into a Kohl's department store. And it is Black Friday and there are doorbuster sales. All the noise and commotion, huh? Not too easy to worship God. Jesus got rid of the aggressive salesmen, the noisy negotiations, the bleeding animals, the congested lines of waiting customers that were getting in the way of people who just wanted to be there to humbly offer their prayers and praises to God. Jesus teaches us that in our worship, we are to decisively remove all sinful distractions to our worship. Do you have some distractions that are interfering with your personal worship or your congregational worship of the Lord? Now, I'm not talking about those innocent, unavoidable ones like the the baby crying during a church service. We want the babies here uh, during church. We're not, not talking about the phone ringing during your morning prayers at home but I'm talking about the things that we may deliberately allow or intentionally do that would take our thoughts and hearts away from concentrating on listening to God's word or offering him our praise. It is possible, even likely, that we have some of these distractions to combat. It could be the busyness of our lives where we take on so many things that it really doesn't leave us much time or energy for the unhurried, heartfelt worship of God where we can give him our best. One pastor confessed that about himself. What did he say? He said, sometimes I'm so busy enjoying doing the work of the kingdom that I don't leave any time to worship the king. (laughs) Could our issue be be maybe be staying up too late on Saturday night? taking on Sunday projects that really could be scheduled for another time, overdoing the weekend sports for ourselves or our kids, watching that extra hour of television that we really didn't need to see because we could have used it for catching up on our Bible reading and prayer. We can easily fall into the trap of sinning by omission. We may be guilty of substituting something that in itself may be very good, but then it ends up squeezing out important time to spend with our Lord in worship. Or maybe our challenge is our distractibility and attention span. Some of us really have to to work on that. Overusing the media and cell phone doesn't really help that at all. Uh, There's no question that it's hard enough to pay proper attention without any external distractions. I recall a story of a man who bragged to his friend about his ability to focus without ever being distracted. he, He and his friend were both Christians, and he told his friend, I can pray the Lord's Prayer perfectly. I can keep my mind 
on every part of it without losing track of what I am saying to God or asking of him. Well, his friend wasn't so sure. And they agreed to place a small wager on it. It was going to be a $5 bet, and the the prayer was going to be on his honor. Now, I'm not encouraging Christian gambling (laughs) at all, but this is how the story goes. Okay, this is what these guys did. So both of them took out a $5 bill. They put it on the table. The friend said, are you ready to pray? He said, yep, I'm ready to pray. So then the man prayed the Lord's Prayer. After he was done, he walked over to the table. He picked up the $10. He smiled, and he handed it to his friend. And he said, you know, I started out that prayer so very well. I was just thinking about what I was saying. But halfway through, I got this thought, how nice it was going to be to have your $5. And it just ruined the whole thing. It's hard to pay attention without external distractions. Our worship in this world is not going to be perfect because our sinful nature will not allow it to be. There will always be some, some lapses in it. But it can be sincere, and it must be sincere from the believing part of our nature. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon warns us, and we heard it in Bible class today, guard your steps when you go to the house of the Lord. Go near to hear rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who don't know that they're doing wrong. For the health of our faith and our relationship with our Savior, let's examine ourselves to identify and as best we can, with God's help, Remove all sinful distractions. Now, after Jesus cleared out the offensive elements from the temple, the religious leaders were not happy, (laughs) and they challenged Jesus to give them a sign from God that he had the authority to do what he did. The Lord gave them a very interesting answer. He said, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They misunderstood. They thought he was talking about the, the earthly edifice. John explains that the temple Jesus spoke of was his own body. Jesus was prophesying his resurrection from the dead when he would be raised in glory and power after his death on the cross for our sins. By his statement, Jesus was also indicating that he was going to be the temple replacement. He was going to be God's new temple, God's new center of worship for all those who are going to be saved. No longer would the temple in Jerusalem be the place where people would go to receive God's favor and assurance of forgiveness through the sacrificial system that God had set up. Now it was going to be through the real Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. It would be through faith in the person and work of the Son of God, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And only through him can a person come to God. So worship, in one part, is what we give to God from our hearts, through our voices, through our lives, in thankful response. But worship always starts with what God gives us. God has given his own son to be our savior. He's the one who reconciles us to God, who turns enemies into God's friends, who gives peace and ends the war. Every worship service in our church points us to Jesus Christ and reminds us and offers us the precious blessing of the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and sure salvation. God gives us that salvation through the gospel in the word and the sacraments. Over and over again, Sunday after Sunday, service after service, he lays those precious treasures before us, and then he works through that word so we have faith in our hearts and have those blessings as our very own. He gives us the water of life to quench our spiritual thirst, He gives us the bread of life to satisfy our spiritual hunger. He causes the light of the world to shine in our sin-darkened hearts so that we can really see the joy of our salvation.
by declaring himself to be the foundation of our faith and the focus of worship, Jesus shows us the primary thing about worship, that God values us so highly that he gives us his son and all his blessings. Blessings that we receive joyfully through faith in his work to assure us that we are his pardoned and paradise-bound people. As we rethink this worship, as we think about seeking God's honor, removing distractions, and believing in our Savior, let us come, then, to worship the Lord with joy in our hearts and praise on our lips our whole life long. Amen. The God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him that you will overflow with hope by the power of his spirit. Amen. Please rise now as we turn again to our, our worship folder and join in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's on page 9 in the worship folder. And we confess... I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with our prayers for the day. Heavenly Father, we... You loved the world and gave your Son to free us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. We confess that without your love, we are lost. Lord of the Church, we thank you for the treasure of the gospel. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Guard and guide those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom. Missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and values as Christians. Keep in your care those who carry heavy burdens in life the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict in personal relationships, and those victimized by war and injustice. Comfort all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Grant them peace, O Lord, and in your mercy, to their guardian and friends, their comfort and hope. Watch over those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. And hear us as we pray in silence. Help us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful even to the point of death that we may receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We also pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we also pray 
Lord, a prayer of thanksgiving that you have gladdened the hearts of the Walshman family with an, a new life. We thank you for watching over both mother and child during the delivery and granting your gift of a life that uh, will bless their family and ours as well. May you be pleased to receive this young girl as your own daughter through the washing of holy baptism in the weeks to come and keep her in saving union with, with you her whole life long. And now, Lord, hear us as we commit our whole selves to you as your devoted and redeemed people. Amen. Receive now the blessing of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated as we close with him 609. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for being here today. Um, it's great just being in the in the pew with you and uh, singing along with you and worshiping our God together. Thank you, Pastor Witt, for the uh, reminder today uh, about what worship truly is. I think so often we think of worship as uh, you know going and gathering together and offering God our prayers and our songs and our offerings and our gifts. But really, worship is first and foremost God coming down to us and giving us his good gifts in, in the word and in the sacraments. I uh, heard it likened, uh, recently I heard it likened to uh, like a waterfall. God's grace is just like a waterfall that comes uh, down and, and waters us every time we gather for worship. And uh, anything that we do in return is just kind of gathering buckets of water and trying to throw it back up that waterfall. So thank you for the uh, encouragement to rethink uh, worship, that here is where God gathers with his people. I want to point out a few things uh, to you all. First of all, thank you all for the, uh, for the prayers and for the encouragements throughout the week we did. Um, uh, we were blessed uh, last Sunday with a healthy baby daughter, uh, Lucy June. She's here today worshiping along with you. So uh, very happy that um, God has blessed us with such a little bundle of joy. Uh, she didn't come with a snooze button, though. So the, uh, so the sleep is a little bit scarce at our house at the moment. So. I do have a couple of things that I want to point out because uh, Easter is approaching and there are a few things that go along with that. Uh, you notice in your worship folder there's an insert regarding Easter for kids. Uh, that's going to be on March 30th. Uh, ages 3 to 10 are invited for Bible lessons and, uh, and egg hunt and crafts and things like that. We could also use some volunteers, so if you are somebody who can help out a little bit with that, either hiding eggs or teaching a lesson, uh, or uh, helping kids through a craft glue some things together, that would be uh, awesome. There is a um, 
sheet in the binder out there if you are willing to volunteer for the day. And if you're um, looking to register your children or grandchildren for the day, there's a link to do that right there on the insert. On the other side of the insert, you have some information about the youth retreat that is going to be on uh, March 15th and 16th. That is an overnight lock-in style retreat for ages uh, or grades 6th through 12th. And uh, the theme this year is preparing to give an answer. We're going to teach young people um, to be comfortable sharing their faith, uh, inviting people to worship, and just telling others about the hope that they have in Jesus. The, uh, one of the activities that they're going to do on Saturday is actually going, about, going around the neighborhood and um, putting that into practice by inviting some neighbors to church, uh, putting little door hangers on their uh, doors and uh, just uh, letting them know about the Easter services and times. And, um, and maybe as we, as a congregation, uh, think about reaching out to others and telling them the good news and inviting them to, to worship along with us, because this is where God gathers with his people, uh, maybe it's good for us to not just kind of pawn that off on the kids and say, well, they'll you know, pass the flyers around the neighborhood and that kind of thing. It'd be good for us, too, to think about friends or um, family members, somebody that you play pickleball with, uh, really anybody that you might be thinking about inviting to worship. Um, let them know about our Easter times. To help you with that a little bit, we did print off a few little cards. They're available on the table in the back. If you're going to bring a friend to Easter worship, um, you can grab one of these and just slide this to them or hand it to them so that they have a good, um, a firm reminder of the date, time, and a couple of other um, thing, uh, pieces of information on there. Uh, you should also know that as we look forward to Easter, we're going to have a property work day on March 23rd. That's a Saturday morning. We'll start at 8 a.m. If you got gloves and rakes and just a little bit of time, we could spruce up the property before uh, Easter. And um, one other thing that I'd like to point out is that on May 18th, it's a couple of months from now, May 18th, uh, Christ Alone is going to hold a rummage sale. We haven't done this before, so it's kind of a new thing. I'm not uh, quite sure uh, what's all going to go into it, but we are going to have a rummage sale on May 18th. I'm telling you that now because you're probably doing a lot of spring cleaning and things like that, uh, collecting things that you're going to donate somewhere. Hold on to those. You can bring them here. Uh, we are going to be um, holding a rummage sale that day. All the proceeds from the rummage sale are going to go toward Camp Compassion. Uh, Camp Compassion is that kids event during the summer that teaches kids not only about the biblical principles of uh, care and compassion for um, others, but also uh, addresses some food insecurity in St. Charles County because the kids will also be um, packing grocery bags on that day. So to raise funds for that purpose, we're going to be having a rummage sale on May 18th. Till the Lord brings us back together again in his name, may Jesus uh, send his angels to watch over all of you. God bless your week. Mm -hmm.